page 59 gets us kicked off tonight. And uh, it start, It opens up talking about Great Britain in 1940. Y'all remember that? Yeah, sure. 1940. And it had the British people right there at the first. That's where I'm reading from. The British people were at war with Germany and were being pressed hard on every side by Nazi military uh, machine. And then this drop down a couple paragraphs. This is an excerpt from Winston Churchill. And he goes on and he's the leader of the time in Britain and actually one of the leaders of the world during this uh, World War II. Uh, you know, we don't see America really get involved until after Pearl Harbor, right? And they really, that's when they really ramp things up really big time. Uh, but we do see them involved a little bit before that. But after that, it was, it was pretty much going wide open. Now go to page 60. I wanted to, to show you here, and what, what they're doing is they're just trying to give you an opening to kind of say, hey, we've, uh, we've seen this type of thing even in the years past and not so long ago, and they're going through the same thing when Joshua comes in uh, right after the Exodus, and we're coming into the Conquest era. So this week, we're looking at the Conquest era. Now, Joshua... He, he's one of the leaders, Moses, or God selects him. Moses uh, gets to come up to the promised land but doesn't get to go in. And then Joshua is able to go in. And then we'll see a couple big events uh, that take place during Joshua's conquest era. Now let's take keep, keep your spot there. It's in that uh, top paragraph on 60. Uh, and this is Churchill's thing. I wanted to share this with you. Uh, it's about halfway through. He says, we shall fight on the seas and the oceans. Y'all see that? And we shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. We shall defend our island. They're talking about, you know, Britain, England. And whatever the cost may be, we shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. Now that right there is somebody that's just at all cost trying to defeat the enemy. You said that with Churchill? Yeah, Churchill. Now, I went online, and I was trying to get it to where I could put a clip up here, the video clip, but it wouldn't copy it. So I, I, was, I found the actual um, speech that he was doing, and it, I could, it found it like on the last, the last few sentences, and it was really good. He's got some other speeches that's out there, and some of it was kind of garbled, you know, because it's back in the 40s and stuff. And, uh, but it was really good. I mean, it, you kind of get the feeling that it's like, you know, we're going to pull out all the stops, and it's to the death. And we're going to fight till the last breath. You know, as Christians, in our Christian walk, uh, we're not fighting with guns and all this to defeat the enemy. It's a spiritual warfare, right? And then... You know, we're like, man, we got to do everything we can do to make sure our family is saved, to make sure our friends are saved, our community. And if we had this kind of resolve or this kind of attitude, it's like, man, we got to do everything we can possibly do to reach our community for Christ. They've got to make the decision. God's got to save them. But it's like, is there anything else that we can do to get the word out? And see, so think about it like this. You know, if we did it like this, and it's like if we got to do it like, I mean, he goes through everything. It's like, man, we're we are not gonna surrender to the enemy, all right? We we're just not gonna do it. And and so in thinking about that, and thinking about the the Old Testament, let's bring it to today's study. Uh, after Exodus, we go into this conquest era, and the circumstances were also very perilous for them. They had swords shields, maybe some bows, you know, real primitive type weapons, right? And so they're going into these lands and to, to take over the land that God told them to take over in the land of Canaan. Now, uh, in that first paragraph that starts off for our lesson, they'd wandered in the wilderness for 40 years because of the rebellion at Kadesh Barnea. Y'all remember talking about that last time, right? Um, now, they were at Jericho, and the test was the same. They, they had the enemy in front of them. 
Joshua's the new leader. They got, they got this fortified city. Therefore, you got the Jordan River. That's the first major event that happens during this conquest era. Now, a lot of people don't know this, but the Red Sea is not the only place where God parts the water and Israel goes through, right? Have you, is there anybody here that hasn't heard of the Jordan River miraculous parting of the water? Laura, you heard of it? You heard the Red Sea? You heard of the Jordan River one? Okay. Uh, Anna, you heard of this one? You don't know? The Jordan River crossing, where they crossed the Jordan River, on, on the, where the water's coming across. Okay. The same people? Yeah. No. yeah. Well, it's not the same people because you had the 40 years in the wilderness. Oh, okay. They're all dead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly the ones that were 21 and younger. 21 and younger, that's, that's right. Uh, God um, decided, he said, since y'all rebelled at Kadesh Barnea, anybody 21 and older, or at that fighting age, they, they were going to drop them dead, and they dropped dead in that 40-year period. So now you have a brand-new generation that's been wandering in the wilderness, and they definitely toughened up, right? Because you've got to be tough to live out in the field like that. Uh, so here comes the, the Jordan. Moses dies. Uh, Joshua's hand-picked. The first challenge is to cross the Jordan River at flood stage. And God commands, that's on number one, God commands him to prepare the nation for uh, a ceremonial procession. And he says the priests go first toward the Jordan. The priests touched the water. God parted the water. And this is the, the second miraculous parting of the water. Now, um, the first one was at the Red Sea. It mentions that. This part, right, the next part, right after the, the, the parentheses, y'all see where I'm at um, on that? That one, y'all see where I'm at? He says, the people respond, God parts the Jordan River for a distance of about 20 miles. All right, now you remember last time uh, during the Red Sea, we said there was like 3 million people, and if they was 100 people wide, it would take them, it, they would be long ways, about 50 miles, and it might have took them two to three days to cross the, the Red Sea. And remember, the scripture said it was in the midst of the Red Sea. Y'all remember that part too? And so here we are. If that, we look at the Jordan. Now, I don't know exactly how, how straight across east to west it is. And this map doesn't have a scale. We have a lot of the people that died during the wilderness, right? But you probably also had a lot of new ones that were born during that time too. So we could be Possibly more than three million at this point. We're not really sure, uh, but anyway, you could uh, afterwards when they get the land and everything, we could count that up and stuff, and maybe find out. But anyway, you got a bunch of people crossing here. God parts that sea, but look who goes first. It's the priest that's going in first, right? Uh, so it, it's kind of a picture of how them as a nation are acting as one, and they're putting God first. And it's the same thing we see when they go to Jericho. All right, now, let's go to Jericho. Uh, that's just a, that's a cool thing to see how they, you know, God just doesn't do it the one time. And you, you have, there's a lot of um, little smart guys or smart people, the so-called smart people, to try to look at the Red Sea. And they say, oh, it was in shallow water. And they just walked across. I was like, man, you're not reading the scripture. It doesn't that say. season of time, it was over flooded. Right, yeah, and during the times. You go back and see the seasons of time. Oh, yeah. and so um, there was some that disputed the Red Sea crossing. I was like, nah, we talked about that last week. To be able to drown the chariots and all those people, it had to be really deep water. You know, I'm not going to drown in no shallow water. Right. Right? I mean, it's just not going to happen. You're not going to drown on a horse unless it's really deep. You know, anyway, that's I, just... I don't mean to keep interrupting. No, you, go ahead. But why did God do it again? Why did God do what? <laughs> do it? On the dry ground. Oh, the dry ground? I, I guess so they wouldn't muddy. Well, uh, God had done that with Moses. Moses was off the scene. Joshua takes his place. 
This way the people see that God has his hand on Oh, you talking you talking about Joshua. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. I was thinking well, I'm saying you. that's the reason he he did that miracle again is so the people would say, Yes, God's hand is on this. Place. He he has uh picked him, hand selected him. Right. Not Moses didn't pick him, God picked him. Right. Yeah. So yeah, that's true. Yeah. So we see I see that too. Uh, and then we also see more confirmation, uh, you know, with Jericho, the other conquests, you know, the, the, the commander of the army of the Lord, which we know to be the Lord. Actually, we see that in Scripture talking to Joshua and tells him to go in, you know, you can take this land. And it takes them, uh, it, we'll see it a little bit, it takes them about seven years to conquer the land. And uh, the, Joshua's triumphs, Joshua, even though God, we know God was the main reason why he triumphed, but God told him, hey, you go there. He still had his part in it. Just like we've got our part today to follow and to serve God, God wants us to be working together with him. We put him first and we move forward and God's like, man, let's go get him. Same thing we see in Revelation, isn't it? That he has the, the army of the Lord, which is all the saints, then he goes down to destroy the enemies. He always wants us to be with him, but him to be first. That's a great thing to see in the Old Testament, but we see it again. Uh, we got, uh, like you said, there's that confirmation with Joshua. And then, um, you know, we, uh, what I was also going to say was there's a lot of uh, military colleges that still study the conquest of Joshua because of how he did it. Even though God was leading him, they said, man, how did he take over this land with all these people with this amount of army? And we'll see that in a little bit, how the direction, how he did it. And, uh, of course, like you said, a lot of times people, um, the worldly people can get wisdom from God's word even though they're ungodly. You know that, right? They, and they could go to Proverbs and learn how uh, to deal with people, but yet not have anything to do with God because there's sound wisdom in this. It's just like if I don't murder somebody, you know, I, I'm not going to have to pay the penalty. But if I do murder somebody, then I'm going to have to pay that penalty. God set in place for the whole world, hey, if you do these things, you're going to pay the price. You reap what you sow. Yeah, you reap what you sow. So, and that's what they were looking at. Joshua's stuff was that the, the military uh, wisdom of Joshua, he had, he had his smarts that God had given him, but he, could, he looked at, uh, like Jericho, he looked at that, and he's like, all right, this is what's going to happen. But then God said, well, this is how you're going to do it. And once that's done, you blow the trumpet, and then you go in. He's like, all right, all right. And he, he's got like, all right, got to have my guys out here. He's still got to do his part, just like we do today. You know, anyway. Go to, uh, we go to the second part where we see Jericho, a miraculous conquest of the city. Now, the city of Jericho was a small oasis. Now, you see this. This is just a little uh, artistic rendering here of what, it, you know, what they think it looked like. But today, they still have the archaeological location and the findings of it. And we'll, I'll show you that in the next couple of slides. And that's where they're getting this from, uh, what I'm suspecting anyway. So see how they had that? They got the upper and the lower. And then you see the, you probably can't read that, but if you, if you look at the video online, you, uh, you might could see it a little better. But I'll read it to you. It's Joshua chapter 6, and this is coming from 1, 20, 1 through 27. It says, Jericho was the first city Israel conquered in Canaan. The promised land after the Israelite marched around the city seven days, its walls fell as the police, uh, priests blew uh, ram's horns and the Israelites shouted Joshua's, at Joshua's command. So, you know, if the story goes, they walked around uh, each time, right? And then on the seventh day, they walked how many times? Twice. Twice around? Seven, seven. seven times around. They walked around seven and then they blew the trumpets. Now, there's a lot of speculation about this uh, miraculous event, too, uh, that I've heard, and I'm just like, nah, you kind of, you're just like, nah, it's not that, it can't be that. It was God that done this, Amen. right? Some people 
they come up and say, well, the horns had a, a, a sonic wave and all this kind of stuff. I was like, I, I've heard horns and bands and all this stuff, and I ain't never seen no bleaches falling. <laughs> Down there in Pearl, man, we had hundreds of bands come through there. Never had no problem. <laughs> but anyway, you hear all kinds of crackpot theories and stuff. I'm just like, no, nah, line it up with Scripture, and we look at it and we say, yeah, that doesn't fit. But then you see something like this, and what? Well, you see something like this. Let me go back. And you look at the walls, and then you look at the, arche the uh, archaeological findings, and you say, well, you know what? That may have been what it looked like. Can't say for certain because we wasn't there. All right, so let's keep going. Uh, the next thing is really interesting here. Let's say a poke right there. All right, this is kind of a little drawing that they had that I found. And I was like, you know, it kind of gets it in your head, like maybe that's how it might have looked, you know. Here we see, I don't know if y'all can see that, you can kind of imagine the priest, and they got, you know, you got the Ark of the Covenant. Y'all remember that? Y'all remember that? They took that into battle. Now, y'all remember what was in the Ark of the Covenant? Anybody? You had the, you had the Ten Commandments, right? What else did you have? You had uh, staff. close. It was Aaron's staff. Aaron's staff. Yeah, Aaron. You had Aaron's staff, and the staff actually budded. Now, for an old stick to start growing leaves on it, that's kind of something to see, right? But then, also, there was one other thing that was in the Ark of the Covenant. Anybody remember? What, what fell down from heaven when I was in the wilderness? Man. The manna. The manna was also in there. A very special thing. Then they also, the actual Ark of the Covenant was designed in a very special way. There was all kinds of speculation about the Ark of the Covenant. And if you've seen the Raiders of the Lost Ark, you probably got some other ideas about it. That's probably totally wrong. But here's the thing. When they brought that in... God was with them, and they brought that in, and they brought that in to the battles, and, man, they were putting God first, and they were marching in with those priests, and, man, they defeated the enemy just like that. But, see, when they didn't do right, God didn't give them the victory. So it, it, we got to put God first in everything we do. And so that, that was kind of interesting to see that, and let's see what else we got here. Here's the ruins, or part of the ruins today. I wanted to show you that. And uh, I was trying to make sure on the reference part, too, because that didn't look familiar to me, but there was some other stuff. And, uh, oh, I, I don't want to go that direction. Let's see. Return, and then we'll go this way. Ah, that's messing up on me now. Let's see, go back. There we go. Now, this looks more like the real deal. The other one... It said it was the ruins, but I was like, ah, uh, it just didn't look right to me. But I wanted to use it and show you that too. And uh, I always, qu always question these things, especially if you're getting offline. I, I want to make sure that my references are right and stuff like that. Now see how that's built. And it's got that. I got another one here. And you can, like, again, like I said, you can, uh, I got, I'm going to put this online in a day or two and you can look at it again. All right, oh, I went too far. All right, this really looks like it to me. All right, let me, oh, let's see, let me go back. I'm going to show that to you again here, tools, and zoom. I wish we could, uh, had a little bit better set up. You see that big mound right there? Does everybody see that? That They're saying that that right there is the ruins or part of it. So. Here's the thing, this, this, the reason I wanted to bring that up in, in this form right here, we can actually go and see this today. All right, man, that's crazy, isn't it? We see something that happened thousands, thousands of years ago, one of the biggest events, uh, one of, I'd say one of the biggest events in history where God gave the people of Israel the victory over the enemy. And these, they did that, the walls fell down, and, they, and it, it was over. And, but that wasn't the only victory that Joshua had. He had many victories after that. 
uh, with God's help and putting him first in all that he did. All right, now, the other thing that's kind of interesting is where it's located. Now, uh, right here, if y'all can see this, I I've pulled this one here. All right, now you see, you got the Jordan River. Y'all see where that's at? About halfway between the Dead Sea and the Sea of Galilee. But it, go down toward the uh, Dead Sea, and that's where Jericho is. But look how close it is to Jerusalem. So here's the thing. All throughout, from that time going forward, anybody could go and see where the walls of Jericho fell down. Right? And it's like, even today, they're like, man, we can, anytime we want to, there's so much history over there and evidence just right in front of them. You know, how, how can anybody today say that the Bible's not true? I mean, we got evidence on top of evidence on top of evidence. And it's always something that they're trying to refute, right? I, you know, it's like, hey, I, I'm tired of trying to explain it to you. I'm tired of trying to prove it. The Bible's going to be around forever. What's the two things that's going to last for eternity? God's people and God's word. Yeah. And so it's like, you know, it'll stand for itself. We're not worried about it. All right. But it's real, it's real interesting to be able, if we wanted to, we could go get us a plane ticket and go over there tomorrow the next day and we could go visit that site and say, wow, this is it. This is where Joshua the people of Israel come around here, blow them trumpets, the walls fell down, and they defeated the enemy. That's just an amazing thing that we can be able to do that kind of thing today. All right, anyway, now uh, we keep going. Uh, number three is the conquest and defeat of Canaan. Now, this is a big set of time here because this is like the next seven years. We got it's almost a seven year period. You got chapter seven through 12. And uh, you got the Canaanites, They're, they got a bunch of different little towns, a bunch of kings, a bunch of cities. Uh, but then you have, um, you got all the militaries that they got. If they all joined together at one time, they might have could have defeated them. But see, God wasn't going to allow that. God used Joshua, and Joshua knew that. He said, well, we can't take them all at once, but we're going to take them one by one. And we're going to keep going through. But now there's a, there's a thing that they did uh, to maintain it. And that's the dominion part that's really interesting too. And this is part of the tactics that are being studied in these military colleges in arms. First they go through and they take one town. And they take the next town. But they're leaving people behind at each one to, to secure it and make sure it's secure. But after everything's said and done... They got all the 12 tribes spread out to maintain it and to maintain dominion. That's how they held it for so long. All right, anyway, that's kind of neat to see that too. But now on the conquest of Canaan, you have the defeat of uh, Canaan right there. Let's go to the next slide here. And I want to show you if y'all can. Now this, come, this looks like one of those pictures out of your Bible right here, don't it? If y'all have... It's kind of like an old school Bible picture here. And it's kind of hard to see it, but what happens is um, that red line, you see that one that goes around, like goes toward the west, and then it loops back around, and then it comes back up to this way, and then he goes right up that way, north to south. See, what he done, he come across and divided it like this. Then he went south. Then he come up north. He he done it in a he did it in a pattern to where he could maintain uh, and be able to conquer them. Of course, you always got to remember God was out front of him and uh, helping him the whole way. All right. Now um, Joshua cuts through the midsection toward the Mediterranean Sea. He's going that direction. That's the first step he does. And we see all this in chapter 7 through 12. Once he divided the land like that, like north and south, then he begins to conquer south to north. That's where you see it going up that way. He didn't even fool with them until he had all this. And so that makes sense. It's kind of like, you, you know how you cut your yard? You're kind of like, well, I'm not going to keep going round and round. It seems like it takes too long. I'm going I'm to do one section at a time, and then I can maintain it, right? Well, that's kind of 
that's kind of simplifying it, but he did that all with all them people and he just moved around, man, it just kicking butt and taking names is what he was doing. And uh, then we see number four, the dominion part. That's like finalizing and locking everything down. And the way that they did it uh, is in chapter 13 to 20, he gives out all these lands to the different tribes. Now there was one tribe when they were going in, that was like, well, we don't want to do all this fighting, so we'll stay right here. And they got that. But see, they didn't get the best part of the land, though. And we see Caleb winds up, he winds up getting some of the toughest parts. And so if you read that section, you'll see who gets what, but some of them are just kind of stand out like Caleb. All right, so here, let's go on to the next one. Now this, the red part is the occupied territory after the seven-year conquest, and this is what they did. Let me zoom it in for you here. Let's see, zoom it in. All right, now, can y'all see that real good? It's all that red part, all right? This is what happens in the 12 to 13, so man, he, he just took over, all right? All right, now we'll go to the next, well, let's go back and I'll go to the next one. All right, go to the next one. All right, now this one is where he breaks all the properties up, all right, or all the lands. Let me go to zoom, zoom that. All right, now, these are your different tribes, okay? Make sure I pause that there. All right, so, who's the biggest one up there? Anybody know? Looks like Judah. Judah? It's Judah. That's the, the, the line of the tribe of Judah. That's our Lord. That's, that's the bloodline he comes through. And Judah was, was always, if you look at the numbers, they had the most troops all the time. They, they was the tough ones. They, saw, they were also in the southern kingdom with Benjamin. And so you got Simeon there, and you had Benjamin. See Benjamin right there? When they divided, after, um, after uh, Solomon, you had the divided kingdom. You had the northern and the southern tribes, and you had Judah and Benjamin in the southern tribe. And you had the rest of them up in the north. The north was all, they got defeated before the southern. And we remember we was talking about that um, a couple chapters ago. And we were talking about the uh, Babylonians. You know, they had the in captivity. And you also had the Syrians. And so that's a whole other deal right there. But just so you can see it. And then we got, uh, y'all remember where Jericho was, right? See Benjamin? And then right below that, Jerusalem, Judah, and Benjamin. It's almost like they were the closest ones to God, too, right? Where's Levi? Levi is all over the place. <laughs> Y'all know why that is? The tribe of Levi? The tribe of the priest. The tribe of the priest. And what they did, if you go, it's a lot of studying to find it, <clears throat> but you can, you know, you can find it pretty easy. If you Googled it or try to look up some commentaries that kind of explains that what they did, they would send priests to different areas, to different cities, and that way they could have sacrifices. But the main, the main temple was where? It was in Jerusalem, right? In the, in the town of Israel. We have Israel, and you have Jerusalem within that. If we had another map, we could show you that. Uh, so we see that. All right, now... Uh, We'll do a quick summary right here, and then we'll close it up. Now, uh, what happened at the Jordan River down at 62? Y'all see it on the self-test? <clears throat> part, part of the water, right? All right, what happened at Jericho? The walls fell. All right, the walls fell, so the miraculous conquest of the city. All right, what happened on the conquest? And defeated Canaan. Defeated Canaan. <laughs> Canaan. All right. And what happened during the Dominion? Finalized. Finalized. All right. Well, what really happened on the Dominion? You had the 12 tribes. Now, they didn't just show up and, uh, you know, park their tent. What they done, uh, what do they call it today? They, uh, it's not colonial, uh, what do you call it? Uh, the colonial stuff or nothing like that. I kind of, that's a different word. 
uh, colonizing. I'm thinking colonizing. But what they do it, they still do it today. Um, when you see the Israelites, they're over on the, they got the West Bank and they got the settlements over there. That's how they take land. You move in and you got people living in houses where they're all loaded up with the AKs and they got weapons. So if somebody tries to come in, they hold the ground. Same thing the United States did um, when uh, there was the 13 colonies and they said, look, we want to move out west. And they gave people land and they said, if you move out there, whatever you mark off is yours. Remember that? I mean, we didn't, we didn't get to do that, but the, our ancestors did that, you know, back in the 1600, 1700, 1800, that if you grabbed that land, but guess what you had to do once you built that house out in the middle of the Apache nation? Any money? You had to defend it. You had to fight for it to keep it. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't free. They said it was free, but you had to fight for that land. And a lot of people lost their lives fighting for that land. But that's one of the ways that they won the West is they kept moving out there and people banded together. And they got, uh, they used their military uh, prowess to figure out, hey, when we go on this wagon train to the, through the Oregon Trail and there's 50 of us and the Indians come after us, we got to put our wagons in a circle so we can defend ourselves. And guess what? They could defend themselves. They, it's like they kept easing out. They kept easing out. Next thing you know, the United States is 50 states, and they got these lands. Now, a lot of people, that's very controversial nowadays, right, yeah. on all that kind of stuff. And But see, they, the government turned around, done a lot of things for the Indians. They don't have to pay taxes. I mean, they build casinos, all kinds of stuff on them properties. People buy cigarettes for what? Nothing. No taxes on them and stuff like that. And so, you know, they tried to make some... They own some, their own uh, casinos. Yeah, they got the casinos and stuff like that. It's a lot different than it was. So, but it, you know, it's kind of it's kind of crazy that our history on some of that stuff. But that's what they were doing. They were moving in, and Joshua said, "All right, you're going to take this land." And they would man put stakes down, and they defended that land. And they was like, hey, "Ain't nobody coming back in here." But after a while, we rock up. We'll see it on down when we get into the kings. What happens is they get away from God, and God says, all right, I'm going to send in the enemy, and, and you can deal with them. And that's, that's what happens, right? They, didn't, they never totally defeated them to start with. Right. Yeah, there were some that they didn't, yeah. Yeah, they, they started being their friends. And right. They made, uh, wasn't it like two different, uh, it was two different nations within that one. Uh, that they came in and they tricked Joshua looking like they was poor. Yeah. And so Joshua had mercy on them and, you know, made a, made a contract, so to say. And, uh, got, you know, they got some trouble. And also at AI, we had some trouble at AI, they did, you know, because they, it was, um, I can't think of the wife's name right offhand, but she was holding some idols or had taken some idols and kept them and, uh, Got in a lot of trouble for that. So, I mean, how are you going to control a whole nation? They have to be of one mind. They had to be of one mind for God to be able to do things. And I don't see how they've done it. Because, I mean, we have trouble even with a few hundred people together, right, uh, to be of one mind. Uh, so it, it's really interesting to see how they did those things. But, yeah, they didn't totally defeat them. Uh, but it was the conquest was over at that point. And, but then we see later on, even with the kings, they had total control over their nation, but yet the good kings would come in and they would destroy all the idols, but then it'd always be, except for a few, or except for some of the Azeroth poles that they had up in the mountains or something like that. Uh, and so it's just, you, even though... Uh, it's like with the flood. E even though God wiped out mankind, all but Noah and his family there was still that sin that was still there, you know. The only thing that takes away the sin is our Lord and Savior. That's it. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and we'll be dismissed. Everybody good? Okay, all right.